Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's episode of Navigator Nuggets. I am your host, Dr. Nicole Rochester. We are continuing our series on coronavirus. Um, I encourage you, if you have missed the first two episodes this month related to coronavirus, they were recorded on March 2nd and March 9th of 2020. I encourage you to go to my YouTube channel and to watch those episodes. You can just go to YouTube and search your GPS doc, okay? And we are continuing this series because, I mean, this is still an active process. This is still an active situation. And it is very important to me to bring this information to my audience. So I am appreciative of all of you who have watched the former videos. Thank you to those of you who are catching this live. Thank you in advance to those of you who will catch this on the replay. I'm gonna go ahead and briefly introduce myself because I know that there may be people watching who are new to the Your GPS Doc family. So my name is Dr. Nicole Rochester. I am a board certified pediatrician, a former caregiver to my dad and the CEO of Your GPS Doc. And the mission of my company is to help individuals and their family caregivers navigate the complicated healthcare system. So one of the ways I do that is every single Monday night at eight o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time on my Facebook page, Your GPS Doc, I bring you Navigator Nuggets. And for about 15 to 20 minutes, usually we sit and chat about all types of topics that are unique and relevant to the healthcare system, from how to choose a physician, to how to get a second opinion, to you know, appealing your insurance company when they have, when you're denied, all kinds of things. But because of what's going on you know, in our country and abroad, so far, every episode in March has been dedicated to coronavirus, and we are going to continue that today. Now, as you all know, this information changes very, very frequently. So what I am sharing today is up to date as of March 16th, 2020 at 6.55 p.m. That's the last time that I refreshed on a couple of websites. So the data that I present is going to be um, up to date as of then. By the time you watch this or even you know, minutes from now, that information could change, okay? I also wanna remind you that this is not medical advice, okay? If you have any specific concerns about coronavirus or anything else related to your health or the health of your loved ones, please contact your primary care doctor or their primary care doctor, okay? This is for informational purposes only. All right, so I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of detail about the coronavirus because we have talked about that in the first episode, which again, I encourage you to find that on my YouTube channel. And I know like me, you all have probably gotten lots of information from the internet, from emails, um, from the news. And so I'm not gonna go back and rehash all of that. Um, but really what I wanna focus on today is that uh, some of the new data, some of the updated guidelines, and specifically the guidelines and the visitor restrictions on nursing facilities and other senior facilities. I cannot imagine how you all are feeling. Those of you who have family members in nursing homes, in assisted living facilities, my dad spent, I think the last maybe two to two and a half years of his life living in an assisted living facility, and he was in and out of a couple of nursing homes. So, you know, my sisters and I visited regularly. And so I cannot even imagine being told that I could not have visited my dad. So again, I can understand and empathize with you. And I, I can only imagine the stress that that is bringing onto family caregivers nationwide. And so I wanna focus on a few tips to share with you all on how you can continue to be, a be your best advocate, your loved one's best advocate, even remotely, okay? So before we get into that, very, very briefly, I'm just gonna recap what you all already know, which is that coronavirus is, uh, it's a group of viruses. They're called coronaviruses because of like the spikes that come off of the viral particle, okay? This is a respiratory virus. The one that we are dealing with now is a novel virus, meaning it's one that we have not seen before. And it is called COVID-19, which stands for Coronavirus Disease 19, okay? And you all know that this is now being spread globally. It has been declared a pandemic. It, we are seeing community spread, meaning it's passing from person to person, people who have absolutely no connection to international travel, okay? This disease is now rampant 
here in the United States. And I wanna say something that I said last week, which is we must remain calm. I know that things are uncertain. I know that things are scary. I am a woman of faith and I am trusting and believing that this is all going to work out. Now, the doctor in me knows that this is going to get worse before it gets better. But I also know that if we implement the precautions that we are being told to follow, we can indeed uh, make this better. We can help mitigate the spread of the coronavirus, okay? This is very, very important. There are things that you can do. There are things that I can do. There are things that we all can do to make this not as bad as it could be, okay? So I want you to remember that. I want you to just take some faith and some solace in that. All right, so now I'm gonna provide some data. Again, this is up to date as of March 16th, 2020 at 6.55 p.m. So globally, there have been 181,377 cases of coronavirus, okay? Of those, there have been 6,119 deaths and there have been 78,085 recoveries. So that is good to know. 78,000 people globally have recovered or are recovering from coronavirus. All right, now let me give you the data in the United States. And this is just mind boggling to me because last week on March 9th, uh, we had 707 cases of coronavirus in the US and we had 26 deaths. Today, March 20th, as of 6.55 p.m., there, have, there are 4,464 cases. Now, I have to caution you because before you go freaking out, that is because we are finally testing more people. The more we test, the more positive individuals we are going to discover, okay? So this is gonna continue to exponentially increase. And yes, it is reflective of the virus spreading, but more importantly, it is reflective of the increased testing. We have always known that there have been thousands, tens of thousands of individuals who are infected and we just didn't know it, okay? So you need to understand that as you're watching the news and hearing these number, numbers skyrocket. Now, of those 4,464 known cases, there have been 78 deaths and 17 recoveries. And there are gonna be more recoveries, but keep in mind in the US, you know, we're still in the early phases of this disease. All right, so let's go over some of the newer uh, recommendations that were not in place the last time we were together uh, on March 9th, okay? So the CDC uh, released some recommendations for the elderly on March 12th. And basically what they're telling us is that for those individuals who are over age 60, and we know that those individuals are at increased risk for severe infection. So if you are over the age of 60, if you have chronic medical conditions like diabetes, heart disease, lung disease, or any other serious medical conditions, or if you have immunocompromised, then the CDC recommended on March 12th that you stock up on household items, groceries, and medications, and that you prepare to stay in your homes for a period of time. And literally, that's what the documents say, a period of time. So they're not giving us an exact period. Why? Because they don't know. There's still a lot of unknowns, okay? Now, on March 15th, there were new CDC recommendations to cancel all gatherings of 50 individuals or more for the next eight weeks, okay? That is brand new as of yesterday, March 15th. And they did say in the guidelines that that does not apply to organizations such as schools, colleges and universities or businesses. However, many of you know that in most of the major cities or many of the major cities across the US, they are closing bars, restaurants, schools, and gyms. And here where I live in Maryland, I think that was announced on Thursday evening. Um, all the public schools are closed. And I think right now they're saying for the next two weeks, but you know, this is gonna be up in the air. My daughter is a college sophomore. We had to go pick her up yesterday and move her home because her university made a decision to um, close and they have an extended spring break followed by uh, online education for the rest of the semester. Other colleges and universities have said online for the next month. So, you know, life as we know it is actively changing, okay? And then today, uh, the, the, during the press conference, the president announced recommendations. Now, these are not mandates yet, but there are recommendations that we not gather in groups of 10 or more. 
So this isn't just for restaurants and public places. This is even within the comfort of your home. All right. And then we know that there have been travel restrictions, some of which are going to go into effect at 1159 PM tonight related to the UK and Ireland, but there are already travel restrictions um, on multiple other countries, restricting travel into the US, Canada has closed its borders. So again, this is an active process, but I just wanted to share some of the updates that are in place since the last episode of Navigator Nuggets. Again, we know that there's increased testing, um, and so we are going to continue to see rises in the number of reported cases, okay? So now let's shift in the next part of this broadcast to talk about nursing facilities, senior apartment buildings, assisted living facilities. In many states across the United States, and I would imagine soon it's gonna be in every state, there are visitor restrictions where basically you cannot visit. Why are they doing this? Well, we just talked about the fact that the elderly are at increased risk for severe infection. And so by limiting the number of visitors, we are protecting our elderly loved ones, our loved ones with lots of chronic illnesses. We are protecting them because we know that if younger individuals get this disease, which they are, okay, don't believe some of the reports that say we're not seeing this in kids. I am a pediatrician. I'm talking with my colleagues who are still on the front lines. They are absolutely seeing coronavirus in children, and they are seeing some with severe disease. However, the majority of patients with severe disease, not just in the U.S., but globally, have been older individuals, okay? And most of the deaths have also been in older individuals. And we know that this whole thing started, or at least from what we know, in the U.S. in Washington State, in that scene, uh, uh, nursing home. So we already know how this thing can spread very quickly in that environment, and we know that our senior population is exceptionally vulnerable. So while I understand that you, those of you who have family members in these facilities are worried, you're anxious, you're scared, you may even be angry and upset, please understand that at the end of the day, these severe restrictions are to protect your loved one. So what can you do? What can you do as a family caregiver, you know, who is unable to visit your loved one during these uncertain and scary times? Well, the first tip I have is a proactive tip. So some of you watching this have loved ones that are not yet in nursing homes, or, but maybe you know, down the line they will be, or maybe they'll be in an assisted living facility or a rehab facility. The most important thing I can tell you all proactively is to choose your nursing home facility carefully. I'm gonna say that one more time. Choose your nursing home facility carefully. All right, hindsight is 2020. You know, you don't want to be in a situation where your loved one is already in a place that is proving to just not be ideal. And now you're trying to deal with emergencies like this. When it is time for your loved one to go to a nursing home, an assisted living facility, a rehab facility, do your due diligence. Research these facilities. Please, whatever you do, do not just allow the hospital social worker to tell you where your family member is going to go. Do not just accept a piece of paper with a few facilities and do any, meeny, miny, mo. Don't do that. You must research these facilities, okay? Now you can go to medicare.gov slash nursing home compare, and we've done previous episodes of Navigator Nuggets about this, but Medicare has a website where they will show you the you know, health inspections data, the quality data, the safety data, and you can begin to vet these nursing homes online and you will see which ones have had penalties and things like that, okay? You can search by your zip code or by your family member's zip code and that is a great way to begin researching these facilities. Nothing beats an in-person visit and if at all possible, I encourage you to visit these facilities in person so that you can see with your own eyes, smell with your own nose, and hear with your own ears everything that's going on in these facilities so that you know if that is an appropriate place for your loved one. Now, if you want assistance with that, because I will tell you it's a lot of work, it's pouring through a lot of data, that is one of the services that I provide as an independent health advocate uh, in the D.C., Maryland, and Virginia area. I will go with you and accompany you 
to the nursing facilities so that I can show you exactly what you should be looking for. For those of you out of, out of this area, the DMV area, I um, have checklists that are available. And so you can you go to my website, yourgps.com, and go to the contact page and reach out to me and I can talk to you about some of those services that I offer remotely, okay? So again, tip number one is to research the nursing home facility prior to your family member being there. If you have done this research and you have visited this facility, they're, they're all facilities have issues, okay? So I'm not here to tell you that if you do that research, that means that everything's gonna go perfectly. No, no, no. And that gets to my tip number two in a minute. But that will at least weed out some of the ones that I literally would not put my dog in, okay? Tip number two is to have an active presence, be actively involved in your loved one's stay at the nursing home or rehab facility. Now, this is why it's really important, if at all possible, that you place your, um, your parent or your grandparent, your aunt, your uncle, your family member, whoever it is that you're caring for, ideally you want them in a facility near where you live, okay? Because you need to be able to visit them, check up on them, communicate with the staff regularly. If, if, if you can't do it where you live, then you wanna make sure that somebody near where they live is able to do that on your behalf. As soon as they move in, you wanna be there. You wanna be introducing yourself to the staff. You wanna make it very clear who you are, what your name is, and that you are going to be actively involved. You wanna write down the names of the staff, the names of the nursing director for that unit where they are, the name of the director of the entire facility, the nursing assistants who are taking care of them. You wanna be taking notes and you want them to see you taking notes because I'm telling you now, and I've said it before, when they see that there is a family member or a friend who is actively engaged, your loved one is going to get good care. It doesn't sound good, but it is the absolute truth, okay? So if you have established a presence, if you have established a relationship with the nurses, with the CNA, the nursing assistants, the techs, then you know when things like this happen and now you are no longer able to visit them, you already have a rapport with them. They already have a rapport with you. So those interactions can continue even though you can't visit in person, okay? So this is very, very important to establish relationships, visit frequently, don't have a set time when you visit, go in the morning sometimes, go in the afternoon sometimes, go in the evenings, pop up unexpected, um, and just be vigilant, you know, be looking around, make sure that they are, your loved one is getting the medications that they're supposed to be getting, that they're receiving the appropriate diet that they should be receiving for their uh, medical condition, that they're getting their physical therapy and their occupational therapy. Stay on top of the staff members, okay, at the beginning. And then again, when, when, if you've done that, when things like this arise, it just makes it easier. You can rest better at night knowing that you have vetted that facility and that you have visited, you have established a relationship and you have determined that your loved one is safe. All right, and then the third tip is the thing that you can do now that you are in this position where we are in the midst of a coronavirus pandemic, your loved one is behind closed doors and you have no way of visiting them. Hopefully your um, loved one, they should have a telephone, okay, from the facility, in their room. So of course, you should be calling your loved one and checking up on your loved one. Ask them, how are they feeling? Ask them about the symptoms of coronavirus, which are lots of things, but primarily fever, cough, and shortness of breath. Every time you talk to them, ask them if they're feeling feverish. Do they feel like they're having chills? Ask them if they're having any type of cough, which with coronavirus is usually a dry cough. Ask them if they're feeling fatigued or weak, Ask them, ask them if they're having any difficulty breathing. If they are having any of those symptoms, they need to be evaluated, okay? And we know that doctors are not living in the hospital. They're not there 24 seven. It's not like a hospital. The doctors don't even see patients every day. So you may have to be the one to advocate for your loved one to say, I want my mom, my dad, my aunt, my uncle to be seen by a physician. And then the physician will determine, you know, whether or not they uh, need to be tested, okay? And then you need to call the nurse, call that nursing station, ask for the nurse who's taking care of your family member that day and, and talk to them and find out how your family member is doing. If they have a cell phone, that's even better because then you, know, you can talk with them day and night. 
If they have a, a iPhone, that's even better. And I am team iPhone. I know some of you are team Android, but what I love about the iPhone is FaceTime. And I have a good friend whose mom is in a nursing facility. And while she doesn't have an iPhone, the nursing staff has been so generous and they have been using their iPhones to allow my friend and her family to see her mom. So that's another thing you can do is ask, you know, the nursing staff, if your parent doesn't have a phone that allows you to, you know, do FaceTime, ask them if they'd be willing to go into the room with their iPhone so that you can have a brief communication with your family member. But you need to check up on your family member regularly, okay? And then talk to the staff, like I said, and get updates from the staff, ask specific questions. If your loved one has expressed any concerns to you, if you have concerns about how they sound, or if you're doing a video call, how they look, then follow that call with a call to the facility, okay? These are very, very important things that you can do to settle your mind and to put your mind at ease. The last thing I wanna leave you with is that if you are not getting the response that you would like, you can always escalate, okay? If the nursing staff is not doing what they wanna do, ask for the director of the nursing staff. If that person isn't responsive, ask for the director of the facility. If that person isn't uh, being responsive, every state has a long-term care ombudsman's office. You can Google that. You can talk to the ombudsman for your state. There are regulatory agencies. I mean, there is always a step higher, okay? But I want to make sure that you understand that you are empowered. You are empowered to advocate for your family member. And even though you can't visit them and hug them and see them face to face, there are other things that you can do to ensure that your family member remains safe in the nursing facilities, in this assisted living facilities during this coronavirus pandemic. I hope this information was helpful. Please feel free to visit my website, uh, www.yourgpsdoc.com, where I have tons of free information, blog articles, things that are of interest to you. And if you are interested in hiring an independent health advocate, please feel free to reach out to me either on my website or you can go to uh, my scheduling link to schedule a 30 minute complimentary call. That is Calendly, C-A-L-E-N-D-L-Y.com slash your GPS doc. All right, guys, I will see you all next Monday, eight o'clock PM Eastern Standard Time on my Facebook page, your GPS doc for our next episode of Navigator Nuggets. Until then, Please be safe. Please stay home if you're sick, okay? Please exercise the precautions that are being recommended. Stay away from these large gatherings. Please wash your hands frequently with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. If you don't have that, hand sanitizer is fine. Please cough into your elbow, sneeze into your elbow, or cough and sneeze into a tissue, and then immediately wash your hands. Let's do our part to protect our neighbors, our community, and the rest of our, our country, and honestly, the world, okay? All right, guys, I'll see you next week. Take care.